So Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to gather with you. Thank you for your love, your provision, your forgiveness that you give and you grant to us. We thank you for all that you have continued to show and direct us and help us be fresh and renewed in our minds and our spirits and hearts and just to learn from you, be at the feet of you and just continue to get through this life and the daily grind that we have or the things that distract us, the physical needs, financial needs, emotional, the mental, all these things are secondary to the most important and the the time to get to know you. Uh, Help us to understand how you use all that to uh, bring us to the most important thing and forging our souls into a molded, fashioned place where we're better suited to know that the next phase of our lives when we get to see you and be in the place where you've prepared for us, we would walk in the the benefits and the blessings and the understanding of it. So we thank you for all that you have done, continue to do. Be our pastor, our guide, our teacher, our counselor, our shepherd, our everything. And this time we look to you to look to answer these questions that we have in our hearts, our minds, our spirits, to look to your word, look to you for the answers. So we ask that you guide, direct, be our counselor, and be our truth and and the the teacher today. And we ask all these things in uh, Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray, amen. Uh, <clears throat> since we're on Q&A too just by, by the way I, we came out of July 4th yesterday and for the first time I've never really read all the way through Declaration of Independence since I was probably a kid so I read it again and I was like really? It's kind of like an entire list of grievances against King George III it was like dude you, you're abusive, you're exploitative you're, you're a jerk, you don't listen you continue to do harm you continue to do violence, you continue to take you continue not to listen to anything we're having to say. You don't give us any value at all, and we try nicely to reach out to you, and enough's enough, boom, we're independent. I never knew that part, and I also never knew that, that we actually, uh, there was a, these list of grievances, you know, I, I, and I didn't know that Declaration of Independence was actually, I never didn't dawn on me that it actually was, was written like five years before we won the war against the, Brit- against the British. I'm like, I thought it was like always in my mind, I'm so ignorant. It was always like the declarative, we won, we're free, you know. No, we, we said we were free, then we went to war, and then we got free. Talk about some moxie of our forefathers to believe so strongly what they, what they <laughs> wrote on paper, win or lose or draw, they could care less. It, it had to be in writing so that that would be the reason why we went to war. It's like, it, it, wow. It's an amazing thing about how um, some people make a declaration of what they really believe after things have already settled. It's much harder to do that when the unknown is in the hands of God Almighty. The unknown outcome, the unknown results, the unknown the end of our life, how it will really end. We don't know the details, but you, you put it in the hands of Almighty God. You put it in the fate of the one who created everything, heaven and earth. And it just is amazing to me that that was um, a strong import that I took from that. That was just fascinating. Anyway, <clears throat> I found it, uh, so anyway, I found it also fascinating the Bill of Rights wasn't added until two years after that George Washington was president. I always thought the Constitution was, was there, and then Washington came in afterwards as our president. I thought the Bill of Rights was already there. I didn't know that was actually two years after he became president. I'm like, what? And so he was president without the Bill of Rights for two years. I'm like, that's crazy to me. I didn't, I didn't realize that. So little things I took, took some stock into taking some different perspectives on July 4th and seeing how God's hand's moving in our lives and, and uh, continue to look into now our Q&A for tonight and looking into uh, the lessons that we have to learn from God himself. And the questions we have on the board, we have one from Sheila. Uh, we have quite a few from Pam. She has an A, B, C, D, E. And then Lainey has a, a huge one about a whole chapter of Ecclesiastes. So those are the questions we have for tonight. We're going to be pretty consumed by these. Um, Sheila has some rabbit trails also on, on Romans. We'll get into a little bit of that. Um, so Pam just joined. Hello, Pam. So we have Lainey, Tracy, and Pam, correct? Yes. Okay. So we'll continue to... Um, to go through. Oh, also for the record, on on uh, on record, I want to also apologize for the fact that um, the the text I put out about the political issue is in regard to the fact that I can't get into details uh, because of issues. But let's just say I have a, a family member who's dealing with li- like directly a government issue, and directly that government issue is um, putting forth things that are not true, uh, invalid, to substantiate a particular position that they have, from which it's affecting. Uh, family member's life directly and it's uh, very very much um, been a hardship and been an emotional financial stress uh, and spiritual test and so that was on my mind when I texted that 
and, and it was just kind of a sense of, gosh, enough's enough with people just lying and not caring about who they're affecting. And so I think that came out maybe too emotional on my part, and I want to make sure that, because uh, it was emotionally driven on the experience. I just had had a phone call uh, with that, and then I just happened to see that, and just boom, I just wanted to make sure that, I don't know, I just was reacting to the situation in my own mind and heart and spirit of the emotion of that. And so I don't want to make, I don't want to have that be something that was um, taken the wrong way. Uh, from how, what I was just communicating was just my emotion of it, um, not trying to like name call, if you will, but I did do that. So again, I apologize for that, about how it would come across, and that, that's just me and my emotion getting the better of me, given a situation close to me that was like almost exactly in the tenants close to that situation. So anyway, I want to just uh, squash that. I'm done with that. So anyway, I had to put that out there. Tim said, been there. So, and Lainey said, for sure. Yeah. And Tam said, Todd's coming on. Okay. So again, I was wrong about that, and I just want to make sure that I just didn't, the emotion of that was too much. It was over the top for me. I just didn't want to, I don't want to be doing that, you know what I mean? So anyway, that's, ah. Okay, so uh, in lieu of that, um, it, I did the same thing, by the way, with the, the other text about the Pope thing, because it just, it just eats at my crawl when someone wants to change God's word. That particular re reference to that one was also just like, you can't just do it. You can have an opinion about God's word, but you can't change God's word and call that an opinion. That's called lying. And it just really is just, it just it just gets the worst of my human sinful emotion. It just flares up and I attack when I see that. And I apologize for that one a couple weeks ago too. So anyway, okay. So um, Sheila's question was Romans 8, 9, and 11. So let's go there. And she wants to look at specifically verse 9 and referencing about the spirit. Uh, again, Pam's got multiple questions. John 11's Lazarus type symbolism of heritage, culture, land of God's people. A lot of people think prayer changes things. Christianity misuses the words hope and faith. Why is that? Prophetic significance of second Passover, Numbers 9, 10, 11. What's the type of symbolic of? And then Laney, Ecclesiastes 9. Yes. Laney said, you know, Preston, I need to ask all of you to forgive my emotions lately. They have been very negative as a reaction to stuff. Yeah, I know. We've all we've all been there, right? It's all it's all uh, been there and done that type of thing. So, yeah, I got the T-shirt, you know. And so I just one of the things I wanted to, to start with before we get to Romans eight and nine because it's going to tie in. You'll okay. see, you'll see later on. Um, something was just continuing to fascinate me lately. I've been dealing with a lot of different things, and I'm on thought about scriptural things. And I <laughs> I want to share with you something that God's been like just really just continuing to just, I just keep, it won't, it can't, I can't get out of my head. And it's the whole thing about how we see the world in a flesh, blood, and bone reality. That's just the way humans are, right? And God sees it in the spiritual world. He even told Moses, build what's in heaven, build it on earth, the tabernacle, which later on Solomon made into a temple. But it was, was fashioned after what was in the heavenlies. It, it was manifest here, but it was already there. God made out of the red clay the body of you and me. He called Ha Adam, the first one, right? So he just makes it and then he just goes, <sighs> and the spirit came into us and made man a living soul. That's that's the Bible. That's Genesis 2 7. So you're like, what? So the clay took the place of sperm and egg which now are being used to form flesh, blood, and bone. There was no sperm and egg with Ha Adam and Eve. There was clay that he formed and fashioned into what we call man, mankind, humanity. From out of that DNA strand came woman as well, same of the same resource material. And now all of a sudden, we have sperm and egg coming together to then God uses that to construct the flesh, blood, and bone we, we call our body. But one thing hasn't changed. God still imparts the soul. <laughs> so in the womb, when a mother and a father have that child that's been consummated and the mother's carrying that flesh, blood, and bone body from the very point that sperm and egg came together, God then just <sighs> blows me away that the living soul of a child is brought to existence 
from God. The, the chassis of this body is just intermingling with that soul from which the earmarks of traits from mom and dad and genealogies are passed on. God intermingles with that in a, in a way that puts the thumbprint of the gene pool of that human's line along with the soul that God gave it. And it's just amazing to me, amazing to me that God chose this decade, this century, this worldly historical classroom for you and me that this was the best classroom for us to learn we need to learn because there was many classrooms of the course of history there was the bc era the latter bc era the early ad era the, the renaissance and all those changes that led up into who we are today and that god chose this time this place as the esther comments to from mordecai to her for such a time as this your body was breathed in a soul by God because he wanted you to be in that body from those parents in this world, in this environment, at this time. I, I, I don't know what to say to that outside of like, yowza, you know, like, like, wow, you know? And so I say that because to end with this, to get into our questions, because God, God actually tells us that the overcomer's person has a new name that we don't even know. And we know that we get another body that's not this one. So wait, 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 wait. Our body's different and our name's different. So that equals, I'm not really me, you're not really you. The spiritual you, you don't see, nor do I. The spiritual me, I don't see, nor do you. And so inside of us is, is our soul, our spirit, our really, our essence of who we are is gonna be named what it was intended to be named by God and given a shape and a form by God. <laughs> that's crazy to, to think about we have a physical reality and we have a spiritual reality and the latter one is permanent this one's temporary and it just amazes me how we get so engaged and so involved around the things of this world that are flesh, blood and bone driven and we put so little attention on the thing that's permanent pretty fascinating so I'll start with that there's more to that I won't say right now because we're on Q&A I'm just going to stop with that. It just kind of fascinates me. For me, I'm just engulfed in it. I just think it's just, I just keep ruminating over that thought and where that leads me in scriptures. So uh, Romans 8 kind of ties in a little bit here because they're talking about the spirit of God, the spirit of Christ. So in Romans 8, often misquoted from verse 1 about there's therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Um, and again, he's talking about those who are in Christ Jesus from a standpoint of being sanctified not just being put in testament, but those who are living in the sanctification of that testament, there's going to be no condemnation. Of course, we know that that's what he's talking about, not just a past tense action, but an ongoing action of being in Christ, living and walking in him. He goes on to define that, which is why James talked about, do not murmur against each other, brethren, in chapter 5, for you will not be condemned. So James says you could be condemned if you continue to live badly, whereas Romans is saying there's no condemnation as long as you're living rightly. As he doesn't say it in those words, but that's what he's talking about, being in Christ and the context about living in Christ, walking in and out of faith. That's what he's talking about. So we're going to look at this more so, and he goes into this in chapter 8. Just read the context for yourself. He's not talking about a past tense act. He's talking about a past tense act that Christ did on a present tense reality of what we must do to see whether or not we're in flesh or we're in spirit. So he goes on, and, and Sheila's uh, question is about the issue of verse 9, 10, and 11. But as a backdrop, he says, But you are not sensual, but spiritual, because the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. But if anyone possess not the Spirit of Christ, he is not of him. And if Christ be in you, the body indeed is dead as to sin, but the Spirit is life as to righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus, Yeshua, from the dead, dwell in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also make alive your mortal bodies through the indwelling of his spirit within you. So, particularly verse 9, Sheila said, pay attention to this one. You really explain this one for me. I said, okay. So, first of all, you got a couple of things. So, when you say the spirit of God, that's the Holy Spirit. And when you say the spirit of Christ, that's God the Father's spirit.
This is God, the Son's Spirit. And when you see the phrase, the Spirit, it's about the context. If the context deals with, with works out of faith, then it's God the Son's, God the Son's Spirit. If it deals with works in faith, then we're dealing with God the Father. Whoops. I want to. God the Father Spirit. All right? So the reality is, is that knowing this as a proof text is going to help much later on in reading the scripture because you get confused otherwise about the usage. The spirit, again, the phrasing the spirit does not always mean one or the other. The context bears it out. And when he says the spirit, does he say the spirit led Christ in the wilderness? Yes. Yes, it does. In Matthew 4 and Martin Luke 4, that's talking about the Holy Spirit led Christ in the wilderness because the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. And he convicts us of our sin. He teaches us. He he leads us in the righteousness. Whereas the Spirit of Christ says, now that you have the education, now that you have the toolbox, so the Holy Spirit's about education. He's about equipping. He's about equipping. Educating. Leading. That's what he does. And of course, he's a counselor, which goes into all of those things. That's what he does. He equips, he educates, he leads, he counsels. That's what he does, of, of many things. Convicts you of sin. He tells you what sin is and what sin is not. When you go, I don't know if that's sin or not, well then, you just being ignorant. Because you know darn well that your flesh talking when you say stuff like that. When you say stuff like that, I really don't know, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know. Yes, you do. And the reason I know you know, because if you didn't know, you wouldn't even say that at all. If you didn't know, you'd just be all enthralled in it. You know there's a torn conflict because the Spirit of God the Father and you, the Holy Spirit, is telling you, really, dude, we showed you this in the Bible already, okay, all right? You know that's wrong, stop doing it. You know that's not a gray area, you know what's up. Stop trying to act like... It's a great, no, da, da, da. you know what's right, you know what's wrong. Stop trying to finagle the fence and ride the coattails of some other malarkey narrative someone puts out there. It's, that's just malarkey. So the Holy Spirit's job is to equip, educate, teach. He teaches you, he leads you, he, he, can, he counsels you. Whereas the Spirit of Christ says, okay, now let's actually, let's bear the fruit. He's about, let's apply it. Let's apply it. Let's use, let's use that knowledge and make it into wisdom applied. Let's actually bear fruit. Let's actually show your discernment by, by the how, how you do something. Not what you do, but how you do it. Not just what you do, but how you do it. Because the Spirit of Christ allows you to have insight. He gives you insight. He is extreme. So he, he takes what the Holy Spirit gives you. Holy Spirit gives you a tool set. He's how to build your spiritual life. Here's your spiritual tool set to be equipped to build your life, to build a house on the rock. Here's your tool set. Check the box, number one. You worship our God, our Father, our Creator, and Spirit and Truth. You got that, son, daughter? Yes, sir. I got it. It's not in my own flesh, not in my own might, but by the power of God. I got it. My Spirit and Truth. Got it. Not what I do, not what I say, not who I am. Spirit and truth, spirit and truth, spirit and truth. Not my strength, not my abilities, not my malarkey genealogy, not my wealth, none of that garbage. Spirit and truth, spirit and truth. Got it, I got it, I got it, I got it. Thank you, God, thank you. Check box number two. <laughs> you know, how do you, what, how, how do you, what's the toolbox and sister? The truth is what? God's word. Can it be someone else's book? No. <laughs> God's word. Okay, what about God's word? Is it, is it, how about books about God's word? No. Only if they lead you back to God's Word. And even then, they're still secondary, secondary, secondary. So what's primary? God's Word. What, what's that? 
39 books of the old, 27 of the new, you know, that will be called the scripture. God's word. That's what the truth is. What do you mean by spirit, God? What do you mean by that? Well, I mean that you have to, again, see beyond what your eyes tell you. You cannot trust your eyes. That's living by sight, not by faith. The spirit is talking about using and spending time in God's word, the truth, and seeing what's not being said within what is being said. I'll say that again. Seeing what's not being said because of what is being said. So when Jesus said, if you believe Moses, you believe me, he wrote of me. And many people in churchianity say, well, uh, you know, if it's not directly stated, then it's not true. Then what, Jesus is an exaggerator or a liar? Which one are you going to have? Because he said Moses wrote about him. There's not much, by the way. Look it up. There's not one mention of his name from Moses' first five books of the Bible. I don't know what you're talking about. Unless you mean, oh, symbolism is now being included, or examples and typologies being included. Well, then, yeah, of course. He wrote, he wrote about him a ton, a ton. He used that. But wait, whoa, 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 whoa. But that's what's not being said directly. That's indirectly, right? That's where the Spirit comes in. The Spirit says, look, you've got to live by faith, not by sight. So you can't believe what people tell you. You can't believe what your eyes see. You can't believe what the majority are believing. It means nothing. What matters more than anything else is what God's Word says, and within that, what God's Word is saying, and then because of what it's saying, what it's not saying. Go where God leads you, because God has a lot of things He doesn't say that are true. For example, the very crux of our whole entire Christian faith is being attacked by those who later on in life turn away from Christianity when they go, you know, the Trinity is not in the Bible. That word's not in the Bible. They're right. It's not. It doesn't say, and God is a triune being. It doesn't say it like that. We say that. The Bible says things that are close to it, though, when it uses the word Elohim, because the word Chim at the end of a Hebrew word is plural. Cherubim, that's plural for cherub. Hello. Eloha is God. Elohim is plural. Hello. But no one wants to focus on that, right? The words itself and grammar, they clue you in. Then there's Adonai, Chave is one, Elohim, right? So Elohim is one, Chave. So hello. So there are scriptures that teach that. The Adonai, said the Mai, Chave, said at that right hand. You know, I mean, the Lord said, there's, the God, the Father said, there's no other Savior but me. So you start putting scriptures together, and you go, well, then if this truth is this truth, and this truth is all true, then if A equals B, and A equals C, oh, well, then doggone it, B equals C too, man. That's this common deduction. If A equals C, and A equals B, well, then B has to be equal to C. There's no way around that. That's just the way. Does it say it, though? Does it really have to? Really? Are you that? Ignorant? Are you that prideful that you say to God, say it the way I want it said or else I'm not going to believe it? Really? If that was the way <laughs> you could act like that, I guess, but if that was the way that God wanted to be done, he wouldn't have written and spoke like he did. I mean, look at the book of John. He spoke in the third person oftentimes. If they say, will you tell us plainly if you're the Messiah? Why would they say that? Because he spoke in a way that wasn't the way people always demand him to speak. Well, pardon me, creation. We are, he's the creator. He can do whatever he pleases, how he pleases, when he pleases, whenever he pleases. Who are you to say to him, talk the way I want you to, when I want you to, how I want you to, the way I want you to, in the same dialect I want you to? Really? No, 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 no. We have to measure up to what he wants, not the other way around. We're just fortunate he loves us and cares about us, came down, was subject to his self, right? So all that being said, I'm getting off topic. We go to Romans 8 again, in verse 9. You, left side of the margin of the dike lot, you but not are in flesh, sarkoi, but are in spirit, pneumatata. If indeed the spirit, the pneuma of God, dwells, which is a constant dwelling, in you. And if any spirit of Christ not has, which is ongoing possession, he not is of him. So what he's basically saying is, you can't walk out of faith if you first weren't walking in faith. Put it, let's put it this way. You can't apply knowledge you don't have. That's what he's saying. You got to have the knowledge to apply the knowledge. You can't have the Spirit of Christ in your life dwelling in you constantly unless the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, was already in your life dwelling constantly. Don't give me this malarkey that you say, Holy Spirit comes later, I can still 
live out of faith. Well, you're, you're crazy. You're crazy. There's no way. You're crazy. You're crazy. That's like saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to exhale before I inhale. When I first, no, no we, first, we first inhaled God's breath. This whole chicken egg thing, you know? Did man exhale first or inhale first? Mankind inhale first. Because you know why? We have no breath. Hello? Right? We had to get breath from God, right? So how can you breathe out of faith unless you first take in faith first? You have to take in faith from God's word, from God himself. He has to impute that in you. And then when you have that faith, you can walk out of that faith. Come on, man. It's not that hard, right? But people in Romans, people in Paul's day, were acting like a horse's patoot. And what Paul's trying to bring out, remember, there was a lot of folks saying, well, I believe in this, and I can buy the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and I can do that and that and the other. And Paul's like, really, guys? Okay, look. First of all, if you're claiming to live out of faith, and you're claiming to actually do the things of wisdom and discernment and bear fruit, then all that can be easily squashed, if it's true or not, by a couple of tests. But the easiest one of all is, tell me, um, answer these scriptural questions about who God is and what he said. And they're like, uh, what do you mean, uh, but you don't know, right? So you don't know. So you, you don't, so you have no knowledge of scripture, or you have very limited knowledge of scripture, but you're putting forth works you claim are grandiose results from God. That doesn't work that way. Paul's like, doesn't work that way. You cannot have no water in the well and then put a bucket in there and come out with water. It doesn't work that way. Now, God can do that. You can't. So nice try. Go back to go. You got to relearn yourself. Get reset because you're obviously living in flesh like Simon did, the sorcerer, trying to act like, oh, look at this, a goose. He's like, uh, really? Peter's like, really, goof? Really, really, bro? Really? Really? Because you do believe, but the knowledge you're trying to act like you have by putting forth these fake realities, stop playing games. It's not funny. Stop. You're making yourself out to be a fool. It's better for people to think you are one to act like one and remove all doubt. Because now we know because you opened your mouth up that you think you're all this in the bag of chips. And I came along with John, and you were like, made to be a fool. Because you can't be acting that way. Now, you can act that way when people are less educated around you. Remember the story of Simon the Sorcerer? As soon as Peter and John showed up, it was like, <laughs> he was exposed like that. Because when someone has knowledge, they come on the scene, the people who are charlatans, they're like cockroaches in, in the night. They move around quickly, swiftly. As soon as the light comes on, they're like, shh, he doesn't see us. Well, yeah, we see it for what you are. You're not in faith. You're acting like you're in faith. Those who don't know nothing about faith, think that you're in faith. They don't understand two different spirits. They think that you're all that and all that because you just made it the narrative. You confuse people because of what they think they hear and they see. They can trust. That's all lies. The only thing you can trust in this whole world is God and his word. And that's it. Like, you can't trust me or any other human. Humans are liars. Humans are sinners. You can do the best you can to want to trust me, and I want to trust you, but I can't trust you implicitly. I want to, but I can't. I, 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 I'm a sinner, and you're a sinner. But I know one who's not. I know who the Creator is. I can trust Him through and through, Jack. Jack. And that's why I can love. That's how I can trust you, by trusting Him and then through me and then through you. So I'm not trusting you, per se. And how do I see you? That's what he's talking about in Romans. How you see each other shouldn't be by the flesh. It should be by the Spirit. Who do you see when you see somebody in Christ? Do you see somebody defined by who, who they are in Testament? Or do you see somebody because of who they're defined by in flesh, blood, and bone? When you see somebody in the Spirit of Christ, how do you see them? Do, do you define them by the, by the specific fruit that they're displaying of knowledge and application of that knowledge? Or are you actually seeing somebody who's actually living in a way that is doing they, what they can to show the fruit of love of God to everybody else? So when he says, and if Christ be in you, left side of the margin, if but anointed in you, the indeed body dead with respect to sin, but the spirit life with respect to righteousness. Meaning, again, like I just said, when you have the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit living in you to equip, educate, teach, lead, counsel, then in faith comes out of faith, the, the Spirit of Christ is going to be living in you, and you won't be in flesh. And when you're living in this, this is what he meant by Matthew 7. A good tree bears good fruit, and a bad tree bears bad fruit. When you're a good tree living in spirit, and out of the spirit, and out of, out of the faith, you, you, can't, you can't sin. But you know how I know that? Because you know, it's not you doing it. It's not you doing it. It's not me doing it. It's the Spirit of Christ doing it. He's doing that. He's doing all that. So you're like, okay. So then he's verse, in, verse, in verse 11, he says, And if, if the Spirit of him who raised 
up Jesus out of dead ones, out of those who have, again, kind of died. Those who have died went on to heaven. Those who die go on the grave. Those who die go on to heaven. Ek Necron. Out of those who died with heaven dwells in you, having raised the anointed one out of the dead ones. In other words, he was raised out of all those who were raised in the heavens. He was raised out of those guys. And if he was raised out of all those that we also know, he was the first fruit of those who were raised to the heavens. Because remember, no one was raised to the heavens from the dead because Enoch and Elijah didn't die the physical way. We, they experienced a death when they went up to there, I would say. But they didn't go through the physical death of sin unto death. They went a different way. But here you have those who had died on this earth. They hadn't ascended to heaven. The heaven lays it all. And so he's saying, okay, he was the first fruit of those from the dead. He says, he raised Christ from those dead ones, Zach Necron, and he will also make alive your mortal bodies through the indwelling of his spirit in you. So it's the indwelling. It's the indwelling. He's trying to make sure you understand that the raising and the raising, he says here, the egiro, if you want to be raised of those who are raised to the heavens, if you want to be raised to a vertical position, from a horizontal position, but not just that, to be raised like unto him and those who went to the heavenlies, the Ekbenkron, those who were, the, uh, he was the first fruit and they were part of the Mia Anastasis. You want to be a part of that? Then the spirit who dwells in you is the one who makes that possible. It's not you. And it certainly isn't me. <laughs> Far from it. I got all kinds of issues. It's not me. That's for doggone sure. And it's not you either. It's God and His Spirit in you and me that allows us and affords us even the ability, even the possibility, even the, even the, uh, the, the, the positioning to be thought of and to be considered to be raised up into the heavenlies. He's basically talking about, again, the fruit-bearing issue, not in Christ, not in Christ. Get out of here. That's just so ignorant thinking. But that's the way churchianity sees everything in the Bible. It's all, it's, not. it's of God or it's not of God. It's about good and all good or it's all evil. And if it's all evil in consequences, it deals with only bad people that don't know who Jesus is. And if it's all good, it deals with people that have to live this way because if they don't, they really weren't good to begin with. All that, all that malarkey. Instead of just dichotomizing God's word, how about, how about here's, here's, shh, here's an idea. How about reading it for what it says and stop the lies to yourself, to yourself, and stop lying about what God never said. God never said that he wouldn't bring any bad upon you. He didn't say that. Matter of fact, he said that he would do that to the Old Testament people if they didn't obey him. We saw that last week. He ain't, fun, he ain't playing around. It's just interesting to me. So Sheila's not here to say the answer to your question, but again, it's the issue of, of the spirit. And I think I answer, I'll, I'll write some more after the, the study, but the issue was about what the spirit is. Now, Christ on the cross paid for our sin debt. And he said, tell yes, I. Which means everything to do and anything to do with sin and its debt payment, done. Hello. It's done. Paid in full. To an accounting term. There's nothing else. That's it. So when your credit company or your mortgage company or your auto company says, pay in full, here's your deed, here's your title to your car, deed to your house, do you have to say thank you? No. Do you have to do it? You have to go to the courthouse and file something? No. It's, your, it's in your hands, man. You got it. It's done. You're good. You're good. It's yours. You're done. You're done. It's an accounting term. Pay in full. Jesus died on the cross. He went down to Hades. He went victorious off the cross. Completed. Fanite. Done. Goes down there. Victorious. Not like Kenneth Copeland likes to say. He says Satan drug his warmy body down there. His demons tormented him. Sacrilege. Heresy. That is damnable statements by a man who is confused and deluded at best and at worst intentionally lead people because he has an agenda to make money off of them, make merchandise of them. I think I've heard that somewhere about Satan doing that same thing. Second Peter talks about people who are false teachers and prophets do that same thing, making merchandise of you. Where'd they get that from? The father of sin, the author of sin. People who are evil, who are taking God's word to twist it, will use it to make merchandise off of you. So, 
He went down there victorious in his spirit. His body was in the grave. He was buried in Joseph's tomb. A, a burial procession was done from which they laid him into the, to the tomb, to the grave, they call it. That's why they said, oh, grave, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Because, again, he was put into a grave, not a gravestone like we think, and buried under dirt of soil of ground and earth. He was put into a tomb, a two-layer tomb, an outside stone and an inside stone. He's put into that tomb, Joseph Arimathea's to be specific. But he was raised. The Spirit of God, the Father, raised him, he says in Romans 8, 9 through 11. Raised him like Shazam. Made him go vertical. But then Jesus himself said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. Okay? So what he's telling you is the Godhead did it all together. They all did it. So I don't have any problem with God the Father, God the Son, saying, I raised up the body of Yeshua. No, I did. Dude, I'm fine with that. Y'all did. So the southern term would go very well there. Y'all did it. I know I didn't do it, so y'all did it. And I'm fine with that. The Godhead, triune God, did, did what they do. He's raised up. He was victorious. He was never off that cross, not in victory. Through the cross in victory, on the cross in victory, after the cross in victory, there was never a time he wasn't in victory. He was always in victory the entire time of his entire existence. He is God. And so therefore, when he went down to Hades, to the paradise this day, to the thief on the cross, he went to paradise that day. And then for those three days we talked about, he gave, he preached the spirits in prison. He was, again, in that freedom. He already had paid the sin debt. There was nothing left to do. And then he rose up, except for what he did do down there. It was not necessary to do to pay sin's debt. Nope. It wasn't necessary for us, the living on the earth, to do anything. He did what he did down there for those who had died before. For those he had died before, that's how much he loves and cares and has compassion on the promises he made before to those who didn't know who he was. To those who never saw him face to face, they got to see him. That's why he did what he did, because he loves, cares, and cherishes the promises of his own character, of his own statements of fact, and he's going to make sure that they put meat on the bones. He taught it, meat on the bones to those who were on the earth when he was there. He went below the earth and said, hey, guys. Let me get you meat on the bones of all those promises you believe that got you into Abraham's paradise. I'm the guy. They're like, he. <laughs> oh, by the way, it gets better. Let's go. Go where? <laughs> You're my plus one thousands, my plus one millions. You're my plus ones. <laughs> Come with me. Other guys in the dark side of Hades are like, what about us? Oh, yeah. You get to stay of execution, but you get to go where the captivity is held captive. But hey, at least the fire part stops, right? That's what he was doing all that time. He wasn't doing anything for us. He was doing it all for them. All for them. His part with us was done on the cross. Done. He was dealing with Old Testament people who already had died. He was dealing with all those folks and letting them know what was going on. He was giving them in three days what he gave on the earth for three years, that teaching. He gave them a little abbreviated cliff note version of that. So the reality is that he rose up with, with the spirit, like God saying to us, we're going to be raised up in spirit. So, in that sense, I hope that answers Sheila's question. I don't know, but she's not here. So, then we go to Lazarus in John 11. We love Sheila, though. Boy, I tell you, she is a, a precious sister in the Lord out there across the pond. Every time Wimbledon comes on TV, the tennis, I always think of you, Sheila. I always think of her and the beautiful green grass and the tradition of England and all the times. Whenever the, there's any kind of thing in the news about the king and queen, I always think of her. Think of you all the time, Sheila. We love you very much, and thank you so much for your heart, your zeal, your passion, and just for God, and, and to, to stay so fervent, being so far away um, with just God and you and his spirit with you, and that's just fantastic to me. It's just so hard to do that. It's easier spoken than done. It's a lot harder to do when you don't have the fellowship of the peoples always around you. So hats off to you. So John 11, when and Jesus was, uh, in John 11, he was told that he was sick, Lazarus was sick, in verse 4 of John 11. And then later on, uh, of course, we know in verse uh, 6, when therefore he heard that he was sick, then indeed he abode in the place where he was two days. Two days. And then so afterwards when he shows up, he had been dead, he had been dead for four days. 
And so there's two groups of, of four there in verse 17. Jesus, therefore, coming, found that he had been already four days in the tomb. So verse 4 finds out he's sick, but he's, his sickness is not to death, Jesus said. But again, he does die. Jesus waits two days in verse 6 to even go toward that direction. The time he gets there, it says in verse 17, he's already dead for four days. So Pam's question is, hey, what's that about? Well, it's about him having, there's two groups of, of two days. There's two groups of two days. There's the days of notice, and then there's arrival. There was two days associated with the notice, then there was two days associated with the arrival after that, equaling the four days. So the reality is they speak to the two different days. Two is a number for witness and testimony in God's numerology. That's not me. That's God. God does that. It's a, it's a number for division, testimony, witness. So God was bringing division, witness, and testimony between the people in Testament and the people of covenant. So Lazarus was a type of those people that he was a literally in life a technon in sperma. So Lazarus in, in, his, in his lifetime, I put him... I put him in the life of Jesus time. He was a technon of sperma. He knew the kingdom things. He was a technon of sperma. But when his death came about, that death was a type of the two groups of people that are going to be raised. There's those in testament and there's those of covenant. Those, he's not, he's not just type of anybody in testament, anybody in covenant, he's type of certain people. Those in covenant only are two kinds. There's the unreconciled, which is evidenced by the circumcision of their flesh, led about by the circumcision of their spirit to follow God's word. Then there's the uncircumcised of covenant that just have the covenant itself unilaterally imputed to them, but they're doing nothing to respect God or his commandments. Those are two kinds of covenant people, unreconciled and reconciled. That's the one group. They were given notice back in the Old Testament. He's arriving two days later, speaking of the arrival when Christ came on the earth, then there's people in testament through his blood that now, like in Lazarus' type, are represented by those who are unsanctified and those that are unreconciled because those people are raised in bodies of flesh, blood, and bone. And those people do not have any solical bodies or spiritual bodies or redeemed bodies to be happy about because they haven't earned the position of right to have that. And like Lazarus, even though in, in reality he was a technon of sperma, he was used to show the type of body that those will have of covenant and those will have in testament who haven't furthered on with their next steps. People of covenant were intended to move on. Not just, they weren't just given notice about the coming of Christ. They were told to understand the coming of the Messiah, who he was. When Christ arrived, he wasn't just speaking for his health. He wanted you to take what he said and actually do it, right? And so therefore, they didn't actually get I mean, uh, sanctified or reconciled. And so both those groups of people represented by the two days. So you have two groups, again, of covenant people, the unreconciled and the reconciled of covenant. Reconciled to the law, by the way, not to Christ. Then you have those in Testament represented by those who are unsanctified and unreconciled. But that is in spirit through Christ. So both these people have bodies, flesh, blood, bone. That's what Lazarus is a type of, which we would call in summation an earthy one, right? 
That's what happens. You have flesh, blood, and bone. Well, how could you complain about that? Why, why are you, hey, man, you know, hey, you're not dead anymore, so why would you, I mean, hey, you're the one who didn't live the way you're supposed to. Within the knowledge you were given of covenant, all you had to do was do what it's supposed to be done. Why didn't you do it? Some might say, well, I did circumcise in my flesh and in my heart. Yeah, but it was supposed to lead you to Christ. Remember, the Old Testament was a pedagogue, a tutor, lead you to Christ. Why didn't you do it? Well, because, because so you're done. How about you in Tesla? How about you? What's your excuse? Well, there was bad churches, a lot of hypocrites out there. I mean, whatever, man. Come on. Did you have me, God would say? Well, yeah. How about my, how about my word? Spend time learning it? Well, you know, yeah, come on, man. He's going to take his to task the teachers and leaders that did influence you wrongly. That's going to be something that they have to answer to. But you have to answer for you. Don't use someone else as an excuse. you got to answer for you. And so that's the reason why they're not sanctified and reconciled. They didn't move on. Should be an L there. And so that's where they are. All right? Now, Pam, I don't know if that answers your question, but you tell me. I'm on question one of like, like four parts to this question. <laughs> Did I answer your question on that part? Adequately, I should say. Yes, no, maybe so. She there, babe? Yeah. Okay. No response yet. Okay, well, maybe she's <laughs> typing a bunch of stuff in. All right. Um, I see Todd joined. I think I told you that, and Vicki is with us. Hello, Todd and Vicki. All right, so I hope that answers your question, Pam. I'm not sure if it does or not, but let me know if Lazarus. She said, she said yes. Okay. Then you have part two of your question, which your, part, your question has, well, I'll say part B. So part A was John 11, Lazarus. Part B is about the heritage, culture, and land. And you say, well, please help to walk through that and what that's all about. Well, so here we have uh, the heritage is Abraham. Why is that? Because their heritage goes back to when Abraham was made, he was made a Hebrew by God. He was not Hebrew. There's no such thing as Hebrew. But when he goes to go rescue Lot from the valley, Sodom and Gomorrah area, they go, there comes Abraham the Hebrew, or Abram the Hebrew at the time. What? You mean the Chaldean, right? Because that's where he's from. What do you mean, the Hebrew? What is that supposed to mean? Well, at the Oaks of Mamre, which means teacher, I believe that God taught him the Hebrew language. God, God out of nowhere, <laughs> put it in his head. This is how you think Hebrew. This is how you talk Hebrew. This is how you walk Hebrew. I'm going to teach you language of Hebrew. And from this point on, he started to live differently and talk differently and act differently. And the word Hebrew, his heritage, began forged by God. He was forged and the, and the venture of walking to a land he didn't know, of a journey that God would lead him on, led him through famine and bad choices and seeing miracles and God delivering people into his hand, seeing him being blessed by much wealth, by having many promises given to him, some unilateral, some bilateral. He had tons of promises given to him. He had four covenants, three testaments, and six appearances from God. That's all. So, so Abraham had four covenants. Three, is that right? I got it written down here. Yes, three testaments. Pam said, so did anyone else know Hebrew then, like his wife? Yes, I believe he taught it to them. I believe that Abraham taught Hebrew to his ancestors. God taught it to him. He was the father of all Hebrews. And he taught it to, to his wife and to Ishmael, to Eleazar first, I should say, then Ishmael, and then Isaac. Absolutely. And they have passed it on for centuries, as we know. So that's what, that's what happened there. Then you have the culture. So the heritage is with Abraham. He's the father. The culture comes from Isaac. Well, why that? Because the culture, is, def it, the culture is, is known as a defined way of life. And Galatians makes total truth of this when Paul says that it was the seed of Isaac 
Isaac was the one used as a type of Christ as the only begotten of the Father that would be sacrificed. He was the defining seed. The defining seed. From which that line, his seed, would then produce the finality of what would be known as Israel. But his seed developed the culture. The culture, the way of life that they lived was to know from that point forward that the stars of the heavens, the sand of the seashore, the dust of the earth was all culminated through Isaac because at the time Abraham was known as the father of many, Eleazar, Ishmael, and Isaac. God defined Isaac specifically as the way of life. The Hebraic way of life was, not, was benefited to Eleazar and Ishmael, but it was passed down directly to Isaac because the heritage of Abraham was carried on to the defining life of Isaac, whose life was put in the way in the crosshairs to be sacrificed. So a culture is a way of life. And Isaac is the one of Abraham's three children that God said, it is this one who will be the one that you will then have the earmark of your break heritage passed on to. Others will benefit, but he is your one you pass on. The seed, the promise is to. He is the one from which, therefore, the culture deals with, so the heritage deals with language. The culture deals with promise. And then you have Jacob and the land. It deals with the name Israel. Their name was changed. It deals with the 12 tribes. Now, all of a sudden, the land is defined by Jacob because he's the one whose name was changed to the land's name from which it came by his namesake, which really wasn't his namesake. It was a land that was named after Israel, which was the name that God gave to Jacob because he wrestled with God. And God said, you'll be now my prince. You'll be called my, the ones that I will then fight for, Israel. God will fight for you. So therefore, the land became not a not a not an actual place of just earth but it became an inheritance so the language was defined in Abraham the promise was defined in Isaac but the inheritance was defined in the first time they really saw something physically they saw it in Jacob when the land was divided amongst when Joshua divided it up when he went into Canaan land. So that's people's Old Testament. By the way, those of us in the New Testament, we have the same thing. You go, huh? Well, yeah, because in the New Testament, we have a heritage. But instead of it being Abraham, ours is Christ. Did I say no more? Because he is the <laughs> testament. The lamb. Without him, we don't have a language to speak. We speak his language, his spiritual. He's the language of love. The language here is of the language of love. That's our heritage. That's our heritage. For we love him because he first loved us. That's his love language, Christ. That's our heritage. God loved us before we even had any inkling of even wanting to love him or being able to love him. Christ loved us. <laughs> Pretty good heritage, man. We could stop there and be done. But no, God's too good for that. He goes on and says, oh, by the way, what's your culture, you, you, you New Testament people? You belong to a culture. What's our culture? Well, like and done to... Isaac, we have a promise too. We have a promise. Our culture is that we're a one, we're a one new man. We're defined in spirit. This is where the ignorance comes in of people who take Noah's story of him and his sons and they start giving reasons to have indifferences of people's color of their skin, which is, to me, 
flat out ignorance. That's not a skin issue, that's a brain issue, and you're ignorant if you look down on somebody because of the color of their skin or their culture. You're just plumb, dumb, ignorant if you do that. I'm just, don't come to me with that stuff. You're plumb, dumb. And so therefore, Christ comes around and he says, oh, by the way, to prove my point, because it's not, it doesn't matter what I say, didn't, didn't Christ make the point clear that it wasn't about any longer Jew or Gentile, but one new man? Defined by what? Physical? No. By what I see? No. By what? By spirit. Huh? By God changing the person from the inside out. Well, wait, 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 wait. So remember that story in the book of Acts, that whole entire issue of the book of Acts, the Jerusalem Council? It's the one new man. That's, that's our promise. That there's no more distinction between Jew and Gentile. That's our promise. There's no more clergy laity, uppity, lowerty. None of this, there's no more of this, you know, infighting. We are, we're all part of the body of Christ. And a soma. Now, some get the benefit of a susoma, granted. But we're all part of the body of Christ. We have one, we're in spirit. Then we have the land. Well, our inheritance now ours, oh, that's heavenly, man. That's heavenly, baby. Right? And that is the new Jerusalem. Because God brought them into the land to give them a land which they would build the city of Jerusalem on. They can have that. I'll take new Jerusalem all day long. How about you? I'll take that one. See how God did the same thing? He did the same thing then as he did now. That was his template. It's a template. He said Abraham's the heritage. The language. Isaac's the promise, the culture. Jacob's the land, the inheritance. Those are the symbolisms. And he's like, pay attention. He said, me, I'm the heritage on the new side. In testament, I'm the heritage. I'm the love language, baby. The language is not a Hebrew anymore, it's love. I use Hebrew language, I use Koine Greek too. Uh -huh. The language is not the human's language, it's the fact that I spoke to you in love, that I came to you in love. I acted out in love. The language is love. I first loved you. <laughs> and then he says, promise, the culture, is that you're one new man. I promised you there'd be no distinction of Jew or Greek. There'd be no distinction of a man boasting and I chose Christ. Nope, I chose you. No one can boast. We all have been made into one new man. None of us chose. None of us. Not one person said, ooh, ooh, that, 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 that. No, you didn't. Just like Isaac didn't say, let me be the one out of Eliezer and Ishmael to be the one sacrificed. It wasn't a vote. God told Abraham to take him. Then there's the land, the heavenly inheritance. It's pretty awesome, too, isn't it? New Jerusalem. So I hope that that helps answer your question about question number section number two, number two point B. To answer your question, Pam, I hope. Your questions are very much involved. We're going to even get to Laney's question today. <laughs> I hope we're good with that. You good? There's other verses I could put on the board. I'm going to, I'll do that after I'm done. There's a lot of verses good. to that. Yep, great stuff. Then we got, why do people think prayer changes things? Well, the easy answer is, is because ignorance. I don't mean ignorance in a mean way. Ignorance in a sense of, they're ignorant. They don't know. You don't know what you don't know, right? And so I used to think prayer changed things too when I didn't know what I know now. I don't think that anymore. But the one thing that really is interesting to me is this verse that you just can't escape. To me, it's the most, it's the most concrete, absolute slap in the face of anybody who says, if you just pray long enough, my cancer will go away. If you just pray... I know that I'll have my bills paid because money will fall from my ceiling or something will show up in my mailbox. Or I just pray long enough and I know that my baby will be fine. Or I'll know that my car is going to get fixed. Or I know that we're going to get the clothes on that house. And I know the storm won't hurt us. And I know that so-and-so, whatever. Right? All those are nice things to hope and pray for. And they may or may not come true. But to say that your prayer dictates that, is insanity. Isaiah 46, verse 9 and 10, are the verses that I'm going to have this on a rock in our house because I just love it. Remember the former things of old, for I am God, 
and there is none else. Isaiah 46, verse 9. I am God, Elohim, and there is none like me. Finite, final. Number 10, verse 10, I love it. Here he goes, ready? He starts off with saying, aha, aha, remember who's talking. You may have heard of me, Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end. The one who was all that, and nobody was there but me. Yeah. Now that you got your attention, it's from that venue I'm talking, God says. Verse 10. Declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, the former that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure or delight. Translated, I've already written the entire future, and there's nothing you can do to change it. Zero. Finite. Are we clear? I'm like crystal. I got it. What's wrong with that? I dig that. I love that. Except when I'm going through a painful experience and I'm getting the living tar beat out of me from abusive situations or people, right? I don't like it then, do I? No, I don't. And yes, I have been in an experience where I've had that life experience. And I've talked to people that have gone through what they would say is discrimination in our country because of the color of their skin. I say, what would you rather have? As an adult, a place to come back to in your castle of Peace Haven, where you can choose to surround yourself with certain people, and then on occasion, you may just by just attrition be out in the world around you, get some yahoos who still hurl hatred things towards you, would you still look back to the haven? But, but if, I, if you had that, but still had a home, and have for the majority of your life of people that you could be around that actually would, would love on you and, and, and affirm you and, and know that you're there. Would you take that scenario or scenario B? Where I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you that for 18 years of your life when you're, since you were a little child up to your 18, you don't have a choice. You're pummeled, you're abused, you're exploited, you're, you're just treated like a piece of turd. Do you want that one? Oh, by the way, you can't change it, right? Because you're just a kid. You can't change it. What would you rather have? Now, granted, that's only for 18 years, and yours is the rest of your life, but I'm just saying. Let me ask you this question. What leaves a bigger scar? I'm just saying. Oh, by the way, there's another question. What are you better equipped to deal with said deep scars? When you're younger or older? Hello, when I'm older. Thank you very much. Right? I'm not using any excuses. I'm just saying. We've all been through some stuff. I get it. And yeah, when God says, I, I've declared everything from the beginning to the end, doesn't sound pretty when I'm going through the cancer, when I'm going through the amputation of my leg, when I'm going through a loved one I have to watch die, take their last breath, when I'm going through a brother-in-law took his life, when I'm going through losing a child in the womb, when I'm going through and so on and so on, right? That's all grievous, man. I get it. It's heartfelt. It, 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 it's, it's crushing. It's devastating stuff. But sin in a sinful world brings about destruction and death. And unfortunately, it comes for all of us. And unfortunately, we're in the midst of it all. We're in the throes of this destructive, hell-bent, dying world. It's, it's all of our fault, collectively. When you start realizing that you're the one with the hammer in your hand, putting the nails and the feet and the hands of Jesus, that was you. And that was me. You're the one who whipped his flesh off of his body and said, yeah, take that. That was you and me. Well, it wasn't there, it, but you were in spirit. You're convicted of murder in God's eyes, of himself. Do you even get that? Do we even get that? We start thinking like that, and you go, wait a second, whoa, 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 whoa. So why did God save? No, anyways, because he wanted to. Well, God said he was righteous, but pretty liberal use of the word, don't you think? Given we know what righteousness is in God's eyes. Pretty liberal use of the word. Thank God for his liberal use of words to be more generous with definitions versus what they really mean. No one can measure up to the real mean righteousness. No one can, except for him. What's he do? He gives it to Noah anyways. Why? I, why would I want to argue with that? Thank you so much. So instead of me looking at the negatives in my life and the bads and the hardships, I don't want to use prayer to change those things. 
I want to use prayer because I want to be communing with God. And that's the number one thing people have a mistake with prayer with. They think prayer can change things because they don't accept who God is. They think prayer can change things because they don't accept who God is. And that means him and his word. They do not accept who he is and what his word says. They will not subject themselves to him and what his word says. They refuse adamantly. They disgust it. They are disgusted by the fact that, wait a minute, did they ram choose? Did God go to Chaldea, the Ur of the Chaldeans? Did he go, uh, I'm taking a vote. Who wants to come with to go to the promised land? Who do I got? Who's with me? Who's my plus one? Is that what happened? No. He says, uh, you, you're with me. Now, yes, sir. And Abraham won. I don't, I don't see no free will in that. Do you? I don't see anybody else out of Chaldees going, I don't, I don't see that. You know what? Tough luck, Chuck. More than you. There were a lot of folks in population back then. God chose one dude, one guy, and his wife to make a whole people. He called the Hebrews. Huh? That's crazy. It's crazy. <laughs> Think about the animals, by the way. It goes for them, too. God says seven are the clean, seven and seven, and, two, and then two and two is the unclean. How about the unclean going, Can, why'd you leave me behind? Because there was unclean animals that were left behind. And there was also clean animals left behind that were destroyed by the flood, right? Why? They're like, okay, you said Noah was right. That's why you chose him and his family. But uh, that doesn't explain why you chose that bear over me. I'm a bear. There was some clean animals and some unclean animals that met their demise on Noah's flood. It wasn't arbitrary either. It was God's designed sovereign will. He knew exactly what he was doing. So some rabbits weren't there. Some rabbits were. Some sheep were on the ark and some sheep weren't. Why did he choose those sheep? Because he wanted to, man. I don't want to tell you. But he wanted to. It's an amazing reality when God says, look, I wrote the entire future. People don't want to accept him. They don't want to accept his word. He's in full control. He's sovereign. He's in, he's in full command. What they'd rather do is do these, do these scriptures that I'll show you for a minute. They'd rather go to these scriptures. I wrote them down to remind me. And they'll say things like, well, I can actually... I can actually, where it says uh, in Matthew 21, 22, I can, I can ask and I can get it if I have faith. Or in Mark 11, 24, I can ask, I can ask and believe and receive it. Or, or in John 14, and Acts th and 14, 13, and 14, I can, I can ask anything. He's going to do it, man. He's going to do it. You know darn well it's not what he's talking about. You know it. And if you don't, you don't have to believe me. Try it sometime. Just ask whatever you want. Just go, just go to the bank one day and go, Lord, I ask you for all of the tellers to give me all the money in the vault just to swing open and give me everything in there and to not be illegal. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, sure. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. You just can't ask frivolously ignorant things, right? That's clearly, un that's clearly known to us, right? But we don't like to accept that so truly. Obvious you can't do that. So we just do it on a smaller scale. And then we say, why does God not listen to me? Why does God not hear me? And we get mad at God. He took my mom when I was young. He took my child when I was having the, that child died at two years old. Those are grievous things, man. Those are hard things to deal with. It's hard. It's grievous. It's, it's, it's heartbreaking. But prayers can't change anything. And what you have to understand and realize is that's just the body. At the soul within it, God decided that the class was over. The learning that they had on this earth that was intended for them was over. Their, their, their usage as a vessel that was affecting other people and things had just ended, that's all. It's not hateful. It's not, it's not evil. The reason why you hurt so much when you love someone so much who's been taken from you, as you say, when God takes them, is because you love them and they love you. Who gave you the ability to do that? God, instead of thanking God for even the emotion itself of love, remember the old adage, better to have loved than lost, never loved at all? We get mad because we want to love and never lose. 
And God goes, come on, man. Are you insane? You're sinners. By the very nature, you're on the losing team. We're on the losing team. And people want to take prayer and change it to say, no, I'm, not, I'm on the winning team. I'm a W. No, you're an L. We're all losers on the sinful side. We're brought into the winning team by Christ. So we're losers and winners' jerseys. We're still sinning. We're still sinners. We're branded with losing. Our bodies will fade. They'll fail. They'll, they'll stop working on us. Our minds will stop working on us. That's, that's not God hating us. That's not him going, <laughs> no. That's this sinful world of the sinful consequence he warned us of, taking a tuition. So prayer changing things. People don't like who God is and what his word says about a degradating, corrupting world that's ruining itself. They don't want to accept the reality of who God is and their reality. They want to look beyond the flesh and blood and bone. They want every prayer to be consistent with flesh, blood, and bone, desires, wants, and viewpoints. And that is why people think prayer changes things, because they think that God is heightenedly interested and curious with the physical. Like God takes the physical realm and says, that's my most important priority today. I'm going to focus on this. He's never done that, like ever. He's always focused on the spiritual all the time, every time. And he uses the physical to get his point across. He's never primarily focused on the physical, not ever. But he uses it to get across his point of the spiritual all day long. Yes? Uh, two things. Uh, first of all, Pam said, but then they'll throw the scripture at you that God wills that none should perish. So they believe that prayer will heal them because they won't perish or die. And then Lainey said, or ask for anything in his name and he will do it. They don't get it. God would be so busy changing things around, he couldn't be God. Yeah, when it says in James 5, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective and avails much. What? Because you know why? Well, you know what a, what a righteous man and powerful and righteous man is doing? Trusting in God, trusting in his word. That man or woman is walking in faith, walking out of faith, walking in spirit, living in truth. And so they're going to think and act and talk to God from that which is put inside their brain cells and their spirit from God. So that's why their prayer is powerful and effective. It has zero to do with them. It has everything to do with their collaborative process from which God and His Spirit, His strength, His power has forged in them a life of spiritual righteousness. And from that, he says, now that's the vessel that I have set aside, that when that vessel prays, fervently and effectively, it avails much. No kidding. Duh. How's that a shock? There's no shock in that. There's no shock in that. It's almost like Rembrandt and, 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 and the famous Picasso painters and, and Da Vinci saying, if I invent or paint something, if I do it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be worth something. You think? Because of who you are, man. Like the old song, the touch of the master's hand. The fiddle was worthless till the master's tightened up the strings and goes, well, of course I'm going to buy the fiddle now. Of course, the greatest of all, God himself, he touches something, he changes something, people, to be powerful and fervent and effective in spirit. Of course, whatever that person then does, because they're touched and moved by God, of course, out and through them, it's God who's using them to bring about a change. It's not that, and they say, they will, he wills that no one should perish. Of course, as we know, 1 Peter 3, 9 is talking not to people, or 2 Peter 3, 9, is talking not to people that are all in the periphery. It's talking to only people that are of God, the people that are in Christ, that none should perish, as we all know this. But they don't know this. That's because they twist scriptures constantly. I was watching a recent, um, and I, I'm going to say they twist it, by the way, I'm going to take the high road, that the majority twist it unknowingly, so they're lying, but not intentionally. They're lying unknowingly. We've all been there and are there without realizing it. We'll say things that aren't true without realizing it. Still a lie. You just don't know it's a lie. So in your heart, you think it's true. So you're saying it from a sense you're convinced it's true, but it's actually a lie. That's what makes hypnotism so interesting. I've seen it done where someone's been convinced that they're something that they're not because the hypnotist makes them believe that. I saw it in front of my eyes happen before. It's crazy as all get out. And yet, but in real life, we do that because we're hypnotized not by somebody doing a trick on us because Satan and sin pulls it over our eyes. We are spiritually hypnotized a lot. 
by this world and what it offers us, by our vantage point, by our perception, by our paradigm. We're hypnotized constantly by what we think is right, and we don't understand what's right. Someone say, well, how do you know what's right? Great question. You know what? I don't, except if God tells me it's right. That's all the reason I could know. I can only know if God tells me it's right. If the word of God tells me it's right, that, that's, all I, that's all I can go on. I can't trust what I see. I can't trust what I feel. And I certainly can't trust what I think. I've got to go by thus saith the word of God. I've got to go by that. So when Isaiah 49, 46, 9, and 10, when he says, I do it all, I, I'm going to go by that. I, he, he's done it from beginning to end. I, I think that's pretty clear to me. It's pretty clear to me. You know? You, you, you can't. And when he was, he was talking to Pontius Pilate and said, you don't take my life. I lay it down. He made it very clear. No one has a right to do what they want with Yeshua. Even in a submitted, weakened, willing state to be sacrificed, he said, all this is ordained unto himself. So those who get mad and say, well, I don't like that God did these bad things in my life. I don't like that he said none should perish. I thought that meant the folks that do perish. That, that, that But how does that work then? Well, wait a minute. How did that work? If he done, that none should perish, then we're all Unitarians, right? We're all Unitarians. I wonder why that. Oh, they have to choose. They have to. Oh, they have to. They have to accept Christ. Oh, okay. I thought you said that none should perish. I thought it says in Scripture in Romans eight, no one can resist His will. None. How, how can how can they do that? If He wills it, they should not perish. Then why doesn't it just happen? Interesting. Yes. Todd said, can you comment on Laney's comment on anything in His name? Yeah, because in John, in John five, in First John five fourteen, if it's according to His will, it says, you got to qualify the verse. In First John five fourteen, so it has to be according to His will. First John five fourteen, I gave you the scriptures where they're going to use, they're going to use John fourteen thirteen and fourteen that say, I ask anything, and He's going to do it. Yeah, but you're taking scripture out of context. You read the entire book, please. First John five fourteen. And this is the confidence which we have towards him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Not according to what I say. Are you out of your mind? That's the answer to that. According to his will. It's like a foregone conclusion. I don't have to say, and I went to the ocean and I caught a fish. You didn't say he was swimming. Really? What was he doing? Sitting around? You know, come on. Fish swim. That's what they do. <laughs> okay? I'll just say it. I was looking in the clouds and I saw a bird. You didn't say it was flying. If I said clouds, what was he doing? Come on. What was he doing? He's flying. He's flying. God even calls him flyers in the, in the book of Genesis. Come on, man. Come on. It's just like when God's saying things about asking for prayer, he's already taking the pretext of 39 books and says, are you kidding me? Like, you don't know it's all about my will and what I say goes. Do I have to constantly say that? Do you not get that by now? What have I not done to demonstrate to you, oh, I don't know, making the world, creating the world, it destroys, I restore it, I make man, that goes south, I make provision. They didn't ask for a, a coat animal skin to be shed. I did that. I did that. I mean, come on. He takes the flood. He, he, he saves people. All these things that he does, he does, he does, he does. He's like, what else do I got to do to tell you? It's all about what I want. How can you not get that? It's just like, it's just so frustrating. If I'm God, I'd be like, ah. But no, God's cool about it. God's just cool. <laughs> yes. He said, perfect, thanks. Yeah. It's what just, was the John passage? For, does John 14, 13, and 14. <laughs> Compared to 1 John 5, 14. A lot of 14s involved. Easy to remember that. So if you go to John, and you take it out of context, and you go to John 14, and John 14, 13 and 14, and whatever you may ask in my name, this I will do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, this I will do. You see? They take that and go, isn't that lovely? Isn't that marvelous? 
Well, yeah, it is marvelous and lovely if you understand the context in which he's writing that, because before and after it, he's talking about, guess what? He's going to leave this earth. He's going to leave the Holy Spirit around for us, to counsel us, to convict us, to lead us into what? Righteousness. So the context is not just to any Tom, Dick, and Harry and Susie Q out there in the world. That's for sure. It's to people in Christ. But not just anybody in Christ, the disciples he's talking to, who are the charged ones to live in a way that is earmarked as a higher level of culpability. And so if you, you guys... Fast things in my name of all those who believe in me. If you guys, is he addressing people on the, on the, on the Mount of Olives there? No, no. He's talking to the disciples. And by the way, minus Judas, he gone. Eleven of them are hearing this, this, this verse, these statements. Not all Christendom. Feels for everybody he's talking to. Why did he say that verse when he was doing the Beatitudes in Matthew 5? Why not do it in Matthew 24 when you're doing that when you came to Jerusalem on Palm Sunday? You did a great, wonderful, wonderful sermon. Why don't you do it then? If it's so important for everybody to know, why do you tell everybody? I don't understand. Why do you tell just these 11 guys? I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's, so, it's almost as if I'm on my deathbed and I'm dying. And everybody that cares about me comes in and shares loving kindness with me, and I share loving kindness with them. And then the last one left is Nancy, my wife, my bride. And so I say to her, you have all my love. And someone records that, and you say, you see what he said to everybody in the room? Oh, my gosh! No, I didn't! Liar! I did not, you're, come on! You're destroying the truth of what I said. And what you're really doing is redefining what I meant, and you know it. And on top of that, you're destroying and diminishing what I placed high value on in my wife. How dare you? How dare you do that? What gives you the right to do that? How do you feel about yourself when you realize you're doing that? And when you keep doing it, stop. Stop. Answer the question. They say, oh, well, come on. He's not going to do this. Talking to them, but it applies to all of us. Okay, I'll, I'll go with that. But my question remains, why do you not say it to everybody? If it's so important, and the truth is so blatantly obvious that that's, what's, that's the highlight of prayer, it's whatever I ask, he does whatever I say. Why didn't he say it openly and to the major audiences when he had the droves following him? Why not? Tell you what, shelf that. How about in Luke 10 when he had the other 70? How about, he, how about saying it to them? Well, why is it that it's, it, it's, it's in this passage here? End of his life, the last night on the earth, to the 11 apostles, and he says that. You don't, the context doesn't matter to you? The frame of reference doesn't matter to you? It should matter because a, con a text without a context is a pretext. And a pretext is no text at all. You wouldn't read a book like that, let alone study the living word of God like that, would you? Would you? Because if you do, you could be wrong. Matter of fact, you more than likely are. So go back, take a little step back and go, you know what? I didn't, I, I didn't intend that, God. I didn't mean that, Lord. I, I didn't see the context of that. Because some things we don't know because we don't choose to know. And some things we don't know because we're ignorant to them. And some things in between. There's always reasons behind our ignorance. That's why God calls willful ignorance the worst. When he's telling you the truth and you refuse to hear it, so you're going to stay in ignorance and therefore continue to sin, that's bad. So if you didn't know the context of John 14, now you do. I just told you. So anybody who heard this, hears this and goes, he's full of malarkey, then fine. If I die today right now right in front of you, I could care less. Read the scripture, know the truth, the truth will set you free. You decide the context and ask yourself the question, why did he not say this openly if it's that vitally important for every human being to hear it? Why? Why? That's my question. Please answer the question. Why? Yes. And say I'm dumb on purpose. <laughs> yeah. So willful ignorance is just a, 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 you can't do that and ask God to please you, to, to be blessing you and all this stuff. It doesn't work that way. I'll put more scriptures on the board when I'm done, but does that answer your question, Pam? about prayer
Hope that answers your question. I hope. Uh, she said, for sure. <laughs> yeah. Todd said, I wish in that scripture it would also have the words of God's will. The words, if God wills. Well, the reality is the reason, the reason why, the reason why it doesn't in that particular context of, of John 14 is the context. Because John 14 is the one talking about he who has my commandments and keepeth them just seven verses later is he who loves me. In the context, he's making it crystal clear that loving him has to do with obeying him. Before and after that statement's made, he made that crystal clear. Whereas in 1 Peter, that wasn't really the, the, the fluidness of what's being pushed. So in 1 Peter, God decided to make that statement according to my will. Whereas in John, the gospel, or excuse me, Peter, 1 John, my apology, and 1 John 5, that wasn't the context flow there about the issue of obeying God and this kind of thing. It was about overcoming and being in a position to live in love. But in John, the love was being defined by obedience. Whereas in the book of 1 John, he's defining love in action an aspect to how we treat one another, how we look to God, how we, how we are living this faith out. So similar, but the focus was on, was on obedience, whereas it was in John 14. So he doesn't need to really emphasize that which should already be a foregone conclusion, because if you're in obedience to somebody, that by definition means subjection. That means you're a subordinate. And when you're a subjected subordinate, what's that mean? Is it your will you're exercising or someone else's? Someone else's. Now you see why he didn't have to say it. He didn't have to say it. Why do I have to say it? If I tell you to obey me, doesn't that already conclude to you that you're subjected to me? That you're subordinate to me? If God tells me to obey him, I get it. I don't know about you, but I get it. That means subject and submit. I got it. I'm a subordinate. That's it? He doesn't have to say all that. I get it. The word obey by itself means subject. You're a subordinate. You must, you must submit. I got it. Subject, submit, you're a subordinate. I got it. I'm crystal clear on this. <laughs> Read the next verse. Again, in verse 15 of John 14. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Do, do you have to really? <laughs> you see what I mean? So it's a matter of the whole context. And right before that, he's talking about the greater works people will do. Again, about the obedience going to between. So anyways, it's, it's just a different reason why God does things. Because again, from our standpoint, we want things to be more clear. From God's standpoint, he's going, do I have to always put qualifying remarks in there? Because you should know enough that the narratives that you human beings try to do, we human beings try to do to God's word and God himself, we destroy and bastardize him all day long. He's saying, stop doing that, man. Just stop doing that. Just know what I mean what I say by already knowing what I have meant and what I have said. If you already have known what I've meant and I've said, then you're going to see it differently. I'll give you an example of this in just a minute. Yes? Uh, Todd said he got it. No, no. Here's an example. I'm watching this show on, on uh, Amazon Prime called To Tell a Stock, and it's about the Bible. It's pretty decent, but there's parts in there where they, the guy is really well-meaning, but he says things that aren't true. He makes this statement in, like, I don't know, number 10 message, and he goes, and he goes, well, God held up the, he tells a story about the serpent being held up and people were healed, and he goes, God didn't force anybody. They had to choose, and God gave us the free will to look to Jesus and free us from our sins. And I went, wait, oh my gosh. You're taking a true story that you said very beautifully, very emotionally, accurately, but now you're assessing it and concluding that that means that God doesn't force himself on anybody, and we have a choice to make. There is a choice to make. You're right about that. God didn't force the choice. You're right about that. But, uh, <coughs> The choice was made to only God's people. That wasn't the Tower of Babel, by the way. That wasn't the backdrop. It was the people of Israel. Hello. It was only them who had the choice to look or not look. They were already people of God. People of God are the only ones that have a choice to sin or not sin. They're the only ones. Only people in Testament have the only choice to sin or not. That's it. No one else has that choice. Nobody. So no joke, we have a choice. I know that. But don't take the context and frame it and say, it's the whole world that's in view, which, 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 which what you were inferring when you said God doesn't want to force himself and everybody can choose Jesus. 
they do that because their paradigm, their vantage point, their, their perspective is that it's a, it's a black and white issue of not of God and of God in the Bible. They don't see things that God does amongst the audience already being people of God. They don't discern that. Because they don't discern that, they come away with a bad conclusion. They result in an erroneous understanding because it's, it's jaded by not knowing the audience, the context in which it's the event's happening or statements are being made. Yes? Two things. Uh, Pam, first of all, said that's one of Hal Lindsey's favorite words. And Todd said, Preston, that's so many levels higher to see and understand that theology. No, I, I get you, man. But it's just, it, it's, I know. But I'm just answering the question. Then you have the issues of hope and faith. People say, and Pam asked the question of hope and faith. So why do people use these words out of context, you ask me? Well, I pretty much touched on this already, but I can tell you that hope can be gained or lost. And I can show you the scripture where he says that in the scripture. It can be gained or lost. So hold on a minute here. I'm going to put that on the board. So hope is gained or lost. And we know this because of Acts 16, 19, 28, 20, and Luke, Luke 6, 35. And what's interesting, let's go there and look at these scriptures. Let's go to the book of Acts. Let's go to the book of Acts. Look at Acts chapter 16. Acts 16, 19. 16, 19. He says, And her master, seeing the hope of their gain was gone, seized Paul because he wanted to dis, you know, dis, get rid of all the idols. And they were gaining money by selling them. The hope of their gain was gone. And Paul and Silas, they dragged them into the market to the rulers. The hope of their gain. The hope, they hoped to have a gain, a profit. Acts 28, 20. Acts 28, 20. He says, for this, see, for this reason, therefore I called you to see and speak with you, for on account of the hope I wear this hope of Israel, I wear this chain. The hope. Not all Israel, but some of Israel would benefit from the future prophetic reality. We all know this. Does he have to really say that? All Israel is going to have the benefits of this hope he's talking about. So, what about Luke 6.35? So that, again, shows a gain or a loss in Acts 28.20. 20. It's not an absolute. Luke 6.35. Look at Luke 6.35. Luke 6.35, and he says, But love your enemies and do good, and lend in nothing despairing. That word despairing is hoping. Don't expect anything in return. And your reward will be great and you will be sons of the Most High for he, is, for he is kind to the unthankful and evil. So again, nothing in despairing. We're supposed not to be and the, is there, there's a root word in that word. It's a don't have anything expecting in return. It's funny how people use the word hope in Christianity. They say, I have my hope in Christ. Okay. I have my hope out of heaven I die. Okay. I have hope in the resurrection. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Okay. Um, hey, is your son playing a baseball game later on today? Yeah. Is your, is your, is your daughter going to play that soccer game? Yeah, yeah. Can I kind of go watch with you? Yeah. I hope they win. <gasps> is that a guarantee? No. So you are capable of using the word hope. That means not guaranteed. And you do use it on an every pretty much yearly, daily, monthly basis. So why as it comes to scripture, you don't use it that way? Why, why, why is that? Because everything's guaranteed. Says so, 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 so. who? When's it guaranteed? Well, Christ said it's finished. I understand, but he also said, other things we have to do to be commanded to do, and there's consequences, and there's all kinds of scriptures about being judged. The best scripture of all, to let you know it's not guaranteed, it's what he says 
in 2 Corinthians 5, 8 through 10, for absent from the bodies present with the Lord, for we all must appear before the tribunal or beam of seat of Christ to give an account, to give an account, to be brought to an adjudication. An adjudication, which is the deliberation of things that are being discerned from this versus that. And what is this versus that, he says in 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10. To give an account of the things done in the body, whether they be good or bad. What? Excuse me? Knowing therefore in verse 11 the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Excuse me? Does that sound guaranteed to you? The verse is going to be awesome, 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 awesome. Like God has some stamp. He has some like participation trophy off to, off to the right of the tribunal seat. And he just goes, you're awesome. You're awesome. You're awesome. Are you kidding me right now? Then why doesn't it say that? How can 1 Corinthians 9 says, I fight not being in the air to win just, just some perishable crown, but I want the imperishable crown because I don't want to be in some way a person who is disapproved. Guaranteed, you say? The Apostle Paul, who wrote a third of the New Testament, said, dude, I'm kind of concerned. A little bit concerned on how it's going to wash out. I don't know. Compared to you guys, you guys lift me up. He goes, I get it. Doesn't matter to me. All I know is I'm a heinous human who killed tons of people. Not cool with that. God forgiven me. I thank God for that. But I've also made mistakes when I was in Christ. Just ask John Mark. Not cool. I lost my best friend in Barnabas. Again, 